so um, it, it's going to be written about, and it'll be. A, uh, so I'm just kind of give a summary of what the paper says. Um, so if you're curious about it and you want to read more, you will have a chance to read more, God willing, in the very near future. Um, one of the things that's tough about working with Yaclean is that they're really organized, and so they have a schedule for everything. And I say, I want this to come out now. Why isn't this out now? And then Ali says, I sent you the schedule two months ago. I said, okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so I am, I wasn't born Muslim. So I'm a convert to Islam. I became Muslim when I was 19. You know what's weird? A lot of people become Muslim when they're 19. Hmm? Interesting, interesting. Uh, it's, uh, you haven't heard about this? Oh, Google it and you'll find this uh, stuff. Okay, so, um, and uh, what's, uh, you know, if you live in a society where everyone has the same religion, you know, like let's say you live in Saudi Arabia, okay, pretty much everybody is Muslim there. Um, you don't really have to think of that much about uh, people who belong to other religions or why people belong to certain religions. It's this kind of out of sight, out of mind problem. But uh, if you're a convert, then it's a really, um, you know, it's a part of your intimate part of your life that never goes away, that, that you used to have another religion or no religion, and then you made a choice to accept another religion. And so then you have to ask yourself, what is the nature of this choice? And um, when is this choice right? So if I say, well, I learned about Islam and I was convinced about its truth, uh, what happens about someone else who, let's say, converts to Christianity and becomes a Buddhist? Um, and they also make that same decision. Well, how do I evaluate, is that decision a correct decision or not? And then um, if you, me personally, as a, um, I guess a scholar is, you know, I think ultimately, ultimately, proof can only come through direct experience. You know, we can sit around and talk about reason and evidence and things like that, but uh, you have debates with your spouses and reason and evidence doesn't make a big difference. Uh, so people, you know, uh, human beings ultimately, reason is based on certain conceptions of reason. Reason is based on certain definitions. If you change those definitions, if you say, change those conceptions, the argument doesn't work as well or doesn't work at all anymore. So, for example, uh, Imam al-Ghazali, uh, he writes in his uh, Deliverance from Error, Munqad min al-Dalal, that he had a massive crisis of faith when he was a young man. As the, as the rector of the Nizamiya Madrasa in Baghdad, he was extremely successful, but still young, and had this huge crisis of faith where he actually doubted everything, he lost his faith in God. How was this fixed? How was this crisis fixed? It wasn't like he read a really good book that explained, you know, why God exists. No, he says, God cast light into my heart. God cast light into my heart. So, for, this is just my opinion. We can, now, that doesn't mean, there's lots of good evidence to believe in God. There's lots of good evidence to be Muslim. But, I think in the end, evidence is, ultimately, deep down, has to be a blessing from God that he puts certainty in your heart. And through my life as a Muslim, Whenever I feel weak or full of doubt or afraid or lazy or all the other different forces that act on us all the time to pull us away from our creator, I always go back not to evidence but to those experiences I've had, those moments of truth where you feel the, the, tr the truth in your heart. Those are those moments that define for me what, it, what, what is true in the world and that's what I go back to over and over again. Um, and so th the problem with that is that it's the ultimate type of proof, but it's also totally subjective, right? So if I say I had this experience, well, then you can go read in, uh, for example, Paul's, uh, St. Paul, you know, the author of the um, good part of the New Testament, right? He had, he converted to Christianity from Judaism because he had an experience like this. And what's the difference between someone having an experience of truth if they're Christian and someone having an experience of truth that Islam is a true religion? Uh, these, the nature of this evidence, you can't compare it. You can't say, okay, put your experience on the table and let's see you know, which one is better shaped or something like that. No, he's, he's, these are subjective experiences. How do we judge them? Um, why am I talking about this? Because uh, these are the kind of questions for me that always come up when I think about people's state who are not Muslim. Um, the way that kind of religions work socially, historically, is it's like a tribe. So your tribe is good, 
and your tribe is going to go to heaven, and everyone else's tribe is bad, and they're all going to go to hell. Right? That's how uh, essentially it works. And so there's this uh, interesting, uh, it's something we come across every day, we don't have a name for it, but I found a great name for it, moralistic therapeutic deism. Moralistic therapeutic deism. It's a very long term, long title, MTD. Maybe that's a better way. It doesn't stand for anything dirty, does it? MTD? Okay. At moralistic therapeutic deism, it says good people are going to go to heaven. And uh, God exists, and he wants you to be a good person. That's the, that's the purpose of religion. It's supposed to make you feel comfortable. It's supposed to make you a good person. If you're a good person, then you're going to go to heaven. We come across this all the time in American life, right? Uh, as long as it makes you happy, that's great. Is religion just about being a good person? How many times do we hear this on a, like, a weekly basis or a monthly basis? So that's the opposite of, tri of this kind of tribal notion of religion. Or is it? Maybe it's just a different definition of tribe. So now the tribe isn't being religious or not, it's being our kind of religious in America now, which is a sort of general, bland religion, which doesn't uh, want to draw the lines of a Muslim or Christian or Jew. So how do we, uh, as, a, as Muslims, how do we make sense of what religion is, is, means in its true nature? What is the true nature of religion? Uh, what is the true nature of guidance? And what is the true nature of people who don't accept, or true fate, of people who don't accept guidance as we understand it in our tradition? This is a huge question. And by the way, as a lot of you probably know, this is one of the questions that weighs heavily on the minds of, of Muslims in the United States, especially young Muslims, right, who go to school and their friend, you know, Billy or Tommy or Susie or Jenny, who are not Muslim, they, the kid doesn't see any reason why this person's fate should be any different than their own fate. And if you try and tell them, well, you know, it's because they're not Muslim, they're, I mean, they're going to say, well, I well, understand, they're a nice person, well, what's, what's the difference? I mean, it seems like they just weren't born in a Muslim family. And of course, we know this from the hadith of the Prophet, who tells us that all uh, human beings are born according to God's nature that, he, that God gave us, the fitrah, which is tawheed, belief in Islam, belief in one God. And then it's our families who make us Christians or Jewish or Zoroastrian, or maybe even, if you're just thinking culturally Muslim, Muslim. Um, okay, so this is the big question. I'm going to try and answer it. Uh, and I'm going to give you three different options. It's like a menu, right? I just was in Japan. It was great. And they always give you an option, like Japanese food, Western food. The Western food always has tons of pork, so it's like Japanese food. So the point, uh, uh, I'm going to give you three options. I'm going to I give you the evidence for them, and I give you criticisms of them. I'm not advocating either one. I'm just giving you the option. Then I'll tell you my, how I would deal with this, with this issue. Okay, but before that, a couple of introductory points. One, when we talk about being Muslim in Islam, uh, there are two aspects of that. One is what's called uh, the shari, iman shari, which is legal faith, external faith. That is your label as a Muslim almost like on your ID. Okay, that means you fall into the Muslim category. And if you live in a Muslim country or in, let's say, a pre-modern Muslim state, that's really important because it means that, for example, you're going to get buried in a Muslim graveyard, you're going to dress a certain way, you have certain rights, you have certain obligations. Someone who's Christian, for example, can drink alcohol, they can have pigs. Muslims can't do that. By the way, this still exists today in Malaysia, where they have a, a parallel legal system. It's illegal for Muslims to drink alcohol, but non-Muslims can drink alcohol. So like you could be, I could be sitting with Ali in, in Kuala Lumpur, and I could, I mean, God forbid, get a beer, and I would drink it, and he could uh, get arrested for it, because they just wouldn't think I'm Muslim. Anyway. Um, so the point is that this, this, was, this has a real legal implication. Uh, if you're a Muslim man, you can marry a Muslim woman. If you're not a Muslim man, you can't marry a Muslim woman. So there's all sorts of legal, if you're a Muslim, you have to pay zakat. If you're not a Muslim, you don't have to pay zakat. So this has nothing to do with the internal nature of someone's soul or what their faith is in the afterlife. You could have someone who's got Muslim on their ID and is going to be buried in a Muslim graveyard and you know, can marry a Muslim woman and all these things. And inside, they're a Satan worshiper who doesn't believe in anything and you know, is a horrible, awful person and could be going to hell for eternity. So this is an external category. 
And this is very important because uh, a lot of times people will get this thing, oh, uh, you said Christians are kuffar. Christians are unbelievers. And that's, and that's mean, you're judging them. That's, that's intolerant. But it's not intolerant. It's, in fact, we don't even have to judge at all. This is simply a matter of legal category. They are not Muslims. And the word for not Muslim in Islamic legal uh, history, they don't say ghayr al-Muslimin. They say kuffar, non-unbelievers. This is a legal category. So that's one way of thinking about faith. This is very important because a lot of the way we interact with people, in fact, most of the ways we interact with other human beings, is through these legal categories. By the way, just like in America, you know, you can have a neighbor who's a nice guy or a neighbor who's a not nice guy, but still you're going to have kind of, you're going to, you know, uh, help them shovel their snow or something like that when it snows, and you're going to, you know, maybe you can borrow something from them. So the second way is faith as your actual internal faith, your inner faith. That's called ilman al-fitri, your internal faith. And that only God knows. We can't know that. We cannot see into each other's souls. I can't, you can't tell if I'm really deep down a Muslim or not. I even know. We can only go by external signs. So the, it's very important to remember, the external type of faith is the, uh, the one we deal with in our dealings with other people. And there the Prophet, the Quran, for example, says, right? God has not forbidden you from dealing nicely and justly with those people who do not fight you in your religion or drive you from your homes. Indeed, God loves those who are just. So God wants us to uh, deal justly and kindly with non-Muslims, provided they don't fight us in our religion or try and drive us from our homes. And the Prophet says in another hadith in Mu'ajim al-Tabarani uh, that uh, the Muslims have obligations for their neighbors. They have to uh, congratulate them if something good happens, console them if something bad happens, give them money if they need it, give them food if they need it, uh, um, uh, lend, them, uh, sorry, lend them money. You have to uh, offer them food. If they can smell your food, you have to offer them food. And you can't build your house up such that it blocks the wind and a nice view from them. Right? So these are, oblig these are obligations you have to your neighbors regardless of whether they're Muslim or not. Okay, uh, second point of introduction that's important, which is that when we're talking about people who are the fate of uh, non-Muslims after, after death or in the afterlife, we are only talking about Muslims or non-Muslims who actually know about Islam. Because a major principle in Islamic theology is that you are not responsible for what you had no control over. And this is the principle or the concept of Ahl al-Fatra, which comes from the Quranic phrase, Ahl al-Kitab laqad ja'akum rasulina yubayna lakum ala fatratin min al-rusuli an taqulu la ma ja'ana nadirun wa la bashir, bashirun wa la nadir, right? You, O oh people of the book, uh, a messenger, our messenger has come to you to make clear our signs to you after a time of weakness in prophecy. What does that mean? A time when the messages of, er the messages of earlier prophets have become either, have either gone out completely and become extinct, or they've become diluted or uh, misconstrued to the point they're not accurate anymore. So the general, the, the, the general position of Muslim theologians is that if somebody does, either doesn't know about Islam at all, or only knows about it in a very inaccurate way, they're not held accountable by God for not being Muslim. This is, is extremely important, because not only does it mean that, let's say, a, um, uh, an Inca guy living in 900, and was that when the Incas were? I should know this. Theoretically like later. Somebody look that up for me. Ali? Okay. Yes? Okay, good. Um, there's no prophets who went to Inca land in that time because there's no prophets after Muhammad alayhi salatu And Lord knows what message that had been sent earlier and was not preserved. This person has no way to know about Islam. Islam was still in the non-Americas. So uh, this person is not going to be judged by God and punished for not being Muslim. Similarly, you can't, it's, if you're a Fox News watching, Donald Trump loving, uh, not leaving their housing uh, hoarder in rural Indiana, right? 
and you only know about the world what you watch on Fox News, you are not going to become Muslim, okay? Because you're going to think that Muslim, Islam, Muslims are terrorists, they're horrible, they're awful, they're repressive, they're sexist, et cetera, et cetera, they're smelly, dirty, uh, you know, et cetera, and they're violent. And why would you ever, you would never become Muslim. You would never even think about it. So uh, these people are all what's called Ahl al-Fatra. They are people who live in a time of vitiated or weakened prophecy. And what's going to happen to them? God is going to judge them on the Day of Judgment based on standards that we do not know. God is just, he will judge them. But we, they're not going to be condemned or punished for not having embraced the message of Islam because there's no way they could have known about it or they didn't know about it accurately. Okay. Um, so here, I'm gonna from, not, from this point on in this lecture, I'm only going to be talking about people who have heard about Islam in a reliable way in a reliable way that's some, some way accurate. Okay, so what are the options? Menu option item, menu option number one. Uh, Islam is the only path. This is, the, this is actually the, the position of every Islamic, traditional Islamic school of theology, right? That Islam is the only true religion. Okay. Um, how do we, what evidence is that for, th for that? Well, for example, the Quran says, uh, whoever wants uh, right? the, if you, uh, whoever seeks a religion other than Islam, uh, it will not be accepted from them and they will be amongst the losers on the Day of Judgment. Or, in the deen and Allah al-Islam, religion in God's eyes is Islam. So this is pretty clear. And there's lots of other hadiths that we could get into uh, as well. But that's the main, uh, the sort of, this is the position of Orthodox Muslims, whether you're Sunni or Shia or Ibadi or anything, this is the, the position of all schools of law and schools of theology. Um, what's the problem with this? I mean, what is, why is this problematic uh, for people, let's say Muslims living in America? It's the same thing I told you earlier, which is, wait a second, um, my, you know, my, my sister, who's not Muslim, she's a really nice person. And that means she's going to be roasted in hellfire for eternity just because she didn't make the same choice I made? I mean, I, I know she should be Muslim, but it doesn't seem to be, uh, it doesn't seem like I can condemn her as a human being just because she's, she hasn't made the same choice I have. It seems like, you know, this is, we all feel this, or lots of us feel this in our heart when we deal with our non-Muslim friends or non-Muslim family. Okay, the second position is, I call it moral theism. Ali, can you hand me my coffee? Thank you. Actually, water would be better. Coffee is not, that's, uh, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Um, second position, moral theism. Is that water? But I already ha I have coffee. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. No, the, uh, yeah, it's a good baraka for me. So, second option, moral theism. Uh, this is, you often hear this verse uh, cited, you know, man amana billahi, inna ladhina amanu wa ladhina hadu wa nasar wa sab'een, man amana billahi wa yawm al-akhiri wa amali salihan, falahum ajrhum anda rabbihim wa la khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzunun, right? Those people who believe, and those, the Jews, and the Christians, and the Sabaeans, those who believe and do believe in God and the, yom, and the last day and do good deeds, they will receive their reward from God. No fear need they have, neither shall they grieve. Right? This is the, and there's two verses that say very similar things. Um, uh, and of course, there's lots of, there's some hadiths, for example, a hadith in Jamil Tirmidhi. Thanks very much, Ali. Now I have like a, a lot of choices. Um, you can have it back. Thank you. There you go. So, uh, the, for example, in Jam al Tirmidhi, the Prophet says, Man call la ilaha illallah dakhla jannah. Whoever says there's no God but God enters, heaven, enters the garden, enters heaven. Um, so, there's other hadith that seem to go along the same lines. And this is, of course, a very comforting position because what it says is, it basically says, if you believe in God and are a good person, 
they're going to go to heaven. Which is, uh, you know, that's, that's sort of very close to this morally therapeutic, therapeutic uh, deism that I talked about earlier. Oh, but there's problems with this. First of all, nobody really held this position until the 20th century. So uh, Muslim scholars, and only very few Muslim scholars, and only Muslim scholars who are really working outside of the kind of what we consider traditional Islamic theology. Uh, people who are, you know, um, liberation theologians like Farid Isak from South Africa, or people who are more modernists like Fazl Rahman, the great Pakistani uh, scholar, died in 1988, University of Chicago professor, by the way. Um, this was the, the arguments they made. Other people like uh, Rashid Rida, the great uh, kind of Lebanese Syrian scholar, died in 1935. He tried to make a similar argument. Um, but and you can see why they're, you know, they feeling, they're feeling the, the need to do this, especially someone like Farid Isak, who is working in, who was working at that time, 1980s and 90s, against apartheid in South Africa, and is there alongside Christians and Jews and all these other people, and Hindus, uh, working against injustice, and wants to think about religion and God as a force for freedom, uh, not a force for division and judgment. So it's un understandable. What are, the, what are the problems with these, this argument? Um, the problem is that these verses, the ones I read, and that hadith that I cited, they are conditioned on they're speaking to people of the book who are being approached about Islam. Okay, so there's two different situations. One is, let's say you're the Prophet Muhammad, and you're in Medina, and there's a Jewish guy and a Jewish lady, and you say, let me tell you about this religion of Islam. I'm going to give you, I'm going to read a verse of the Quran to you, I'm going to explain it to you, and then um, your religion, by the way, originally came from God. And I know you're a pious person, you're a believing person. You believe in the, 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 the religion of Moses and of, of Abraham, and you do your prayers and you, worship, you respect the Sabbath. But I'm a, a new prophet, I'm the last prophet in this series, and I'm bringing the final version of this religion. And I'm asking you to accept it. So those verses I read and those, that hadith I stated, they're all prior to this choice that the person is, is, makes. If the person embraces Islam, that's wonderful. But if they say, you know what, I don't think so. That person has literally told the prophet of God to his face that they don't believe him. Either he's a liar, or he's crazy, or he's, I don't know, misguided or something like that. But that is, you know, that is the ultimate kufr. That's not, you know, Jonathan Brown, I don't believe in Islam because Jonathan Brown tried to explain it to you. This is telling the prophet of God himself uh, that they, you don't believe in his religion. So the, the, oh, these, these, these statements about other communities, not, you know, those Jews and Christians, those who believe and do good deeds, no fear, neither have, neither shall they grieve. This is premised on, this is describing their condition before they're given the choice to be Muslim or not. Okay. Um, there's another, by the way, another interesting option, right? Which is that just because you're Muslim doesn't mean you're not going to go to hell. I mean, so if you're a Muslim and you commit lots and lots and lots of sins, like you're a serial womanizer, an alcoholic, homeless person murderer, okay, that you're technically Muslim, like you might eventually go to heaven, but you're going to get a lot of punishment for that. A lot of punishment. Um, of course, God can forgive anybody he wants. And God's, you know, the prophet's intercession is extremely important and all these things. But the point is, just because you're a Muslim, doesn't mean you just go into heaven exact, you know, and you never suffer anything. Uh, you, lots of Muslims will suffer in the fire before their crimes or sins are burnt off them. Well, isn't this, couldn't this also be true for, for non-Muslims, right? Isn't there, a, the, maybe, maybe these, these statements or these condemnations of, of other religions, these criticisms of uh, improper belief in Christianity or in, in Judaism that you see in the Quran, maybe this means that people are going to suffer, but ultimately they will, um, they will also uh, uh, enter paradise. And this is an interesting position that's it's taken up by of that person you always think about when you think about mercy and softness, Ibn Taymiyyah. Right? Ibn Taymiyyah, the famous Damascus scholar, died in 1328. He argues that a hellfire will one day extinguish, be extinguished. Why? Because God's mercy overwhelms his anger. Okay, this is something you find in the Quran and the reliable hadiths, that God's mercy, 
God's mercy encompasses all things. His mercy overcomes his anger in the Hadith. So if, God's, if God is absolutely merciful, and that mercy is greater than his anger, then by definition, eventually that anger is going to be overcome by the mercy and the punishment of hellfire will end. So this is uh, the position of Ibn Taymiyyah, and one of his students, Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah, probably held the same position. Uh, but uh, it's, it's uh, gen really limited to these few people until the modern period when some other Muslim scholars also embraced that position. Okay, uh, option number three. This is something you, uh, I don't know if, and maybe, uh, has anyone ever read the study Quran? Study Quran is a very good, uh, HarperCollins study Quran is an excellent project. I blurbed it on the back, and then I discovered that Muslims are apparently the only people who read those blurbs because the people who, a lot of people involved in the study Quran project were uh, what's called perennialists. They belong to a school called perennialism. I don't think that really affects the study Quran because I think it's a great book and very useful. Um, but people, some, some Muslims criticize it because a lot of the editors were Muslims who have this perennialist position, which I'll explain to you right now. What perennialism says is that uh, all religions that have at their root celestial revelation, a revelation from God, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, right, uh, that they are all true that they are all true. Uh, because there's only one truth, and therefore there can't be, you know, there can't be more than one truth, right? All, all, all things that are, all things that go back to God in the end have to eventually go back to truth. Um, they don't really have a lot of evidence for this from the Quran, except, you know, some verses that say, you know, all matters return unto God. Um, but in general, this is not something that you find clearly stated in the Quran or the Hadiths anywhere. And it's not something that any Muslim scholar that I know of ever upheld until the modern period. Um, sometimes they say that Ibn Arabi had this position, but I don't think that's accurate. Uh, what the perennialist position says is that the criticism that the Quran levels against Judaism or Christianity or other, or, or, or let's say idolatry, are not criticisms of the original form of Judaism or Christianity, but are criticisms of the kind of corrupted and uh, deviant forms of those religions, which is the, the kind of mainstream of those religions. But that at the core of those religions there is truth, and if someone who follows those religions is actually following that, that, that uh, original core, they are actually following the one true religion of, of, of God, of Islam in a sense. Uh, again, the problem with this is there's not really any evidence for it in the scriptures to which we look for evidence in things we say about our religion, the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. Uh, second, and this is something I only thought about when I was writing this presentation, is that, wait a second, if you're telling me that this, the criticisms that the Quran levels against other religions are really only about the mainstream of those religions, not their true authentic core, then you haven't solved the problem because my neighbor isn't a true, authentic, core Christian perennialist. He's just a guy who celebrates Christmas, okay? And, you know, goes to church every couple of weeks. So you haven't solved the problem of what's going to happen to all these non-Muslims around me because they are all following the mainstream versions of these religions that you yourself, perennialist, have, have said the Quran is condemning. Okay, does this make sense? Again, I thought about that. I woke up really early this morning because I was in Japan. And I'm seriously jet lagged, so I don't know if my thinking is 100% sound. What do you think? You think, yeah, he's, he's okay, okay, good. Um, so th these are the three options. So one, I said, is the kind of the orthodox Muslim approach, which is Islam is the only true religion. Two, uh, kind of moral theism, which is if you believe in God and do good deeds, you're, you're, you'll, you'll be saved, you'll, you'll be okay in the end. The problem here is that um, the evidence we have for this is premised on that person accepting the message of Islam. And finally, the perennialist position, which is, it's really interesting, uh, but 
it doesn't really have any evidence from the, this, the, 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 those sources of evidence that we actually consider authoritative in our religion. And so if I can't find it in the Quran or the Sunnah of the Prophet in any explicit way, what, uh, by what right am I going to make this claim and going to have this belief as a Muslim? Okay, so um, when I say I'm going to give you my approach now, this isn't like I invented this. Okay, this is not Jonathan Brown came with his approach. I'm telling you this is what I follow based on uh, the tradition of Islamic scholarship, which is, a, this is, I'd say actually, this is the orthodox Muslim position. Um, so you can think of it as like the other half of that orthodox position I gave you at the in the beginning. The first part is Islam is the only true religion, but now take this as the second half of that sentence. So uh, the principle of Islamic scholars is you don't judge people's fates. You do not judge the fate of in individuals. Uh, there's a great uh, verse of poetry. I don't actually know where it came from, but I've heard it from a lot of scholars. Uh, right? Do not rule, do not pass judgment on anybody that they're going to go to heaven or hell if you want to follow the sunnah of the prophet. The sunnah of the prophet is you do not cast judgment about people's individual's fate in the afterlife. And there's a great uh, saying of the companion Ibn Abbas, I didn't even drink the water in the end, where he says, Right? It is, it is not for anybody. Nobody should judge or declare what God is going to say about his creation. Or, and it's not for anybody to say, this person is going to go to heaven and this person is going to go to hell. So when we say Islam is the only true religion, or Christianity and Judaism and all these uh, other religions are not true religions like Islam, uh, these are statements about paths. You can think about, about a methodology or about a belief system. But it's not a statement about the individuals who follow those belief systems, because only God knows the fate of people. Remember, this goes back to that, the, the second introductory point I made, which is that the external marker of Christian, Jew, Muslim, are markers that allow us to interact with each other in a kind of a vahiri outward way. What actually is in our hearts is known only to God. So the, you know, Ahmed Muslim might internally be a Kafir and, you know, uh, Anthony the Christian might be actually someone who believes in the oneness of God truly in their heart and is, does tremendous good deeds and will go to heaven. We have, we have no way of doing, knowing that. All we know is their external condition that we, that for Muslims at least, uh, has, in, has some ramifications, right? Has to do with, uh, you know, whether you can marry the person, whether you can inherit from them, get, inherit, to, you know, bequeath to them, where they're going to be buried, things like that. Okay. Uh, so the, the first really important point for this second half of the orthodox position is that you don't judge individuals, you only judge um, religions. This is my wife's advice, she just says, don't get personal, deal with issues. She's right about this. Okay. Um, the second important point is the mercy of God. Right? As we, I've touched upon this a bit earlier, which is the mercy of God is overwhelming. It encompasses all things, as the Quran says. It, he, God as one, he prescribed mercy for himself. His mercy overwhelms his anger. The, the Quran, every chapter of the Quran, except chapter 9, as we all know, begins with Bismillah rahman rahim The mercy of God is beyond our uh, capacity to understand. And, you know, I'm not a super sensitive guy, but uh, not like very uh, cuddly. But as I became a, become a parent, when I became a parent, I started to understand what it is to have mercy and love for things, even though they don't like treat you well or listen to you or urinate on you and things like that. So you you know you start when you have a child, you start to feel this like sense of what it means to have mercy for something that's that you love, even though that thing doesn't treat you right, doesn't respect you. So God, this is the mercy of God is like a zillion times more powerful than that, to the extent that. Uh, people who despise God and hate God, 
are still given blessings by him, just constantly. Their very life, the fact they're alive is a blessing that they've received and that they continue to receive as long as they're alive. And there's a, a beautiful hadith in Sahih Bukhari where uh, the prophet uh, explains to his companions, there's this woman whose child died and she's going around trying to breastfeed different children just to hold the child and feel a child against her body again. And the prophet says to his companions, um, God's mercy and for his creation is more than this. Uh, is, this is just a, basically a taste of God's uh, mercy for his uh, creation. So this woman's love for his child and mercy for her child is just a, a feeble, shadowy representation of God's mercy and love for his creation. Um, there's also another a wonderful hadith in Sunnah of Abu Dawood, which talks about, the Prophet tells about these two Jews back in the t days before Islam, in the days of the Kingdom of Israel. There are these two Jews, and one of them is a really, you know, he's like, a, you know, he'd probably be like toxic bachelor or something like that. You know, he's like hard partying, uh, bad social life, right? Um, and this other Jew is really pious, and he tells his sinning friend, you know, you're going to go to hell. I'm pretty sure of it. There's no way God can, can forgive you, you're going to go to hell. And the story is, I don't know if it's a true story or if it's like meant to be a, a lesson that the prophet is telling. So the story is that God, because of this statement, takes the, the sinner and gives his, forgives his, his sins and puts him in, in paradise and condemns the, the person who said that to hell. Because God says in this story, uh, you have no right to put boundaries on my mercy. So remember that. I mean, we condemn behavior. We condemn actions. We condemn beliefs. We do not condemn people to hell. Because in doing that, you are limiting that aspect of God's uh, existence that he has said repeatedly in the Quran and the Sunnah is unencompassable and unlimitable, namely his mercy. There's also, uh, and this is my, my, my last point, there's a very interesting uh, book edited by a guy named Muhammad Hassan Khalil, who's a professor at Michigan State. A, and it's a, a book on, I think it's called Islam and the Fate of Others. And in it is an essay by uh, T.J. Winter, Abdul Hakim Ra. It's a very interesting essay. And he has a, a fascinating idea. I thought this was really uh, maybe a novel contribution, um, which is the shifa of the Prophet, the intercession of the Prophet. So we know from very reliable hadiths that the Prophet will intercede uh, on the behalf of his followers, especially the people who've committed grave sins, kaba'ir, the grave sins in the Muslim community. And so one of the ways on the Day of Judgment that even a Muslim can escape the punishment of the sins they've committed is to receive either just God's mercy directly or to have the Prophet intercede on their behalf. Now in Sahih Bukhari, there's a fascinating hadith where the Prophet says that one of the things that, dis things that distinguishes him from all the other Prophets who came before him is that their shafa, ah, their intercession is only for their community, whereas his intercession is for all of humanity. And it's very interesting, the famous uh, scholar uh, Murtada Zabidi, Murtada Zabidi, who died in 1791, he was originally from India, but he studied in Yemen and he ended up living in Cairo, and it's debated about where he's buried. If you go to Cairo, they say he's buried there. If you go to Yemen, they say he's buried there. I haven't checked in India. But the, uh, he says, in his discussion of this hadith, he says, it is possible that the Prophet could extend his shafa, his intercession, to non-Muslims because they're part of humanity. And in theory, his shafa, his intercession, can go for, uh, to any person, whether they're Muslim or not. So that was a very interesting kind of novel uh, uh, contribution to this, to this discussion. So the, the, the last point I want to end on I'll be done even before. Look at the size of those, that writing. It's very clear. You've been working on that for a while, haven't you? So the, the, the last point, and this is the fundamental point that Muslims, I think Muslims should keep in mind, is as the Quran says in numerous places, several places, 
ليس الله بظلام للعبيد God does not wrong any of his servants. God does not wrong any human being. And this is, this is for me what I always remember in my heart. Whenever I meet uh, a really nice Buddhist or a really nice Christian or a really nice you know, Hindu or anything like that, I always remember God is not going to wrong this person. And while I can say I think their religion is deviant or I think their religion has serious flaws in it, and though I can say that because they're not Muslim and I am, there are, some cons cons there are some differences between us, right? They can't go to Mecca. I can go to Mecca. Just like when you go to Salt Lake City, you can't go into the Mormon tabernacle if you're not Mormon, right? Um, uh, there are certain outward differences between us. But I cannot tell this person, I cannot, I, I, I know in my heart, I do not know this person's fate. And I know that God will not wrong them in any way. And this is the, 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 the thing that, you know, for me kind of helps me make sense of this question. What is the, what is the, what is the fate of non-Muslim? Is that they will not be wronged. And whatever injustice you think there is in how um, we think about we, we, how we talk about claims of truth and uh, truth and religious truth. Um, none of that matters when God passes judgment on people, because He will pass judgment in a way that is the ultimate justice, and He will not wrong anybody, even uh, you know a mustard grain worth. Jazakumullah khair. So I'm here, Dr. Brown. Um, we have about probably 20 questions. I tried my best to categorize them into three different topics. Um, so I'll list those, inshallah, before, so we have enough time to cover the majority of the uh, issues. Number one, um, Dr. Brown, you talked about uh, the category of people that didn't get to, uh, weren't exposed to the, the sincere message of Islam. How do we differentiate uh, between someone who's ignorant and someone who genuinely does not know Islam or get to know that know Islam in their life, and what are the boundaries surrounding? Um, like, is there a benchmark they have to reach of going out of their way to learn about Islam, and once they reach that point, they're no longer applicable to receive salvation? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So, in one sense, the question doesn't matter because uh, it's sort of it's an academic question, right? Because it doesn't. It doesn't matter uh, if they're not technically Muslim, then I'm trying to think of a good example, right? So if they're not technically Muslim, then if they die, they're not going to get buried in a Muslim graveyard. And that's from the point of view of human beings. It's these outward, el outward uh, manifestations of religion that are the, the thing that we interact with. Um, so but if we're going to say, OK, well, I want to think about this. That's an interesting question. Um, uh, when you know what do you have you know what's like due diligence what's the due diligence you have to do to have uh, learned about Islam properly um, first of all you have to be they have to hear about it in a reliable way they have to hear about it in a way that is accurate it doesn't have to be the best exposition of Islam ever given by any human being but it has to be accurate right so if someone comes and says Islam is a terrorist religion that teaches you to be violent and oppressive and that's all you ever hear about Islam, then you're not, not only are you not going to be held accountable by God for not being Muslim, but you're probably not going to be held accountable by God for even not researching it further, because if someone comes to me and says, you know, hey, do you want to join this Satan worship cult? And I say, no, thanks. I'm not going to think about it anymore, right? I'm not going to be like, actually, let me, let me look into this. You know, let, me, uh, let, me hear, let me hear your full pitch, right? No one's going to uh, listen to that, right? Um, there's a, some modern scholars, uh, Rashid Rida in the early 20th century was the first person to propose this. Uh, more recently, Sheikh Yusuf al-Qaradawi uh, proposes as well, which is that um, people have to hear about Islam in a way that's not just accurate, but also compelling, in the sense that um, if I say, uh, someone says, well, what's this, what's this Islam thing I just heard about? And I say, well, Islam is a religion founded by a guy named Muhammad in the seventh century, and uh, there's five pillars, and these pillars say A, B, C. Um, that's all accurate, right? But the guys, whoever hears this, is probably not going to say, you know, that's interesting. I want to hear more. I want to learn more about this, 
right? There, it's almost like they've, they've read it on like a medical form or something. It's completely uncompelling in any way. That, uh, so Rashid, Rashid Ridla and Yusuf al-Qaradawi propose is that in order to uh, really be held accountable by God for not embracing Islam, it has to have been presented in, to you in such a way that it would be compelling to someone if they heard this. Uh, and therefore, your rejection of it isn't sort of you're deciding not to go with uh, something that's really uninteresting, but it has to be a manifestation of kufr, which is a rejection of truth. So f in order to reject truth, first you have to see truth, know that's truth, and then you reject it. It can't just be, you know, I rejected about something I heard that doesn't really interest me, even though it's technically accurate. Um, that's an interesting uh, proposal. You know, uh, people can kind of evaluate it at whether they think that's a good argument or not. But as I said, it's kind of an academic discussion because it doesn't affect how we actually interact with people because it's still technically not Muslim. Um, and so that's how we would interact with them. Second, second category of the question revolves around um, a lot of converts in the room they are talking about how can we talk about salvation um, in terms of da'wah to their family and close friends? Um, how can we not look intolerant how can you use this concept of salvation Islam to help them love Islam and look into it? Mm. You know, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to it. I'll tell you what, I'm like the worst dawah giver. That's my... You know, so I, I always try to be super, um, you know, soft and tolerant with my family. Um, I never, you know, told them... It was kind of the opposite of a sort of fire and brimstone approach. And no one in my family ever became Muslim. Okay, then my friend who became Muslim, he was, you know, you have to say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. I do not want you to burn in hellfire for eternity, right? And his parents, his grandmother became Muslim and his mom became Muslim. So uh, I don't know what to say. Like uh, maybe that's just their personality, but I, I don't know what the right answer is. If you ask me, judging, you know, how, how do I think, you know, based on what I know about American society and how people react, I think that my approach is better, but uh, maybe I'm totally wrong about that. So I think, uh, I don't know how to answer the question except to say that, you know, you have to deal with the people you know well in a way you think that they're going to be open to. Um, and uh, beyond that, I, I don't know what advice I could give. I wish I had, you know, maybe there's people in the room who are, you know, there was this one guy I heard about, my friend told me about him once, he used to, he lived in New York as a Bengali guy, Bangladeshi guy. He would walk around the subways in New York and he would go and stick his hand into people's shirts, I assume men, and say, I bring you the message of Islam, God loves you. Except he would say it in a Bengali accent, you know, which I don't want to try and do, it would be offensive. <laughs> so, uh, the, and people would just be overwhelmed. And a lot of the people, according to my friend, God rest his soul, Ahmed Hussein, who told me this story about this guy. A lot of people became Muslim this way. I mean, so uh, maybe this person had real baraka, and people were overwhelmed by that baraka. I take that totally seriously. I think that is 100% legitimate. So I think it really depends on um, what tools you have. In this case, this guy had apparently the magic touch, literally. And, uh, you know, I didn't have that. Well, third category of questions we have is uh, revolving around um, our own salvation as Muslims growing up in Muslim families. How can we, how, how, how can we measure it and know that we will be saved um, if we feel we just got lucky that our parents are Muslim? And what if I have doubts about Islam or if I have big questions? Um, why is it that I am lucked out with um, this golden ticket to paradise mm -hmm. when I have friends who are way more moral than me that are not Muslim. Again, Christ. you don't have a golden ticket to paradise. Right? Nobody has uh, a golden ticket to paradise. Um, if you're, even if you're, let's say you're a Muslim who has the minimum, like you believe in God deep down, okay, but you are just, you're like, I'm, let's say Muslims, I meet these people a lot. They go to college and they're like, okay, time to cut loose. After I graduate, I'll become a good Muslim again, but for the next four years, I'm gonna party. I meet people like this a lot, all the time at university. Uh, if you commit lots and 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 lots of sins, uh, there is no guarantee you, in any way that you're going to not suffer for those sins, even if you're Muslim. 
right? So, um, you know, it's like saying, uh, you know, uh, I have to sit through a bunch of boring meetings for the next eight hours. Eventually, the meetings are going to end, but that doesn't stop, stop the fact that I'm going to suffer mightily for the next eight hours during these boring meetings. I mean, you're, you, you, just because eventually, because you have a grain of faith in your heart, and the, 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 the Prophet says this very clearly in numerous hadith in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, that people who have a grain of faith in their heart will eventually enter the garden. They will eventually uh, enter paradise. If you just have a, grain, a mustard seed grain worth of faith in your heart. But that doesn't mean that you're not going to suffer tremendously b before that. So uh, that's, I think, the, the way to think about it. That it w I would say that, and I'm not trying to criticize people who ask this question, I think it's a, it, it represents a very common mindset, which is that we, especially when you're you know, let's say you come from immigrant background and you're living in America and you're told, you know, you're a Muslim, these other people are not Muslims, and you don't necessarily know what that means, um, is that this isn't a tribe, right? This isn't a club where you're a member and then everything is great for you and other people who aren't members, everything's bad for them. You're still going to be judged based on your belief and your, and your deeds. 